Everybody, welcome to another installment of Show to Be with Mike G, the show of life, the show of France, the show of cognac, the show of sidecars, and so much more. Today we sit down and chat with the legendary Benedict Hardy. She is the CEO and the main ambassador for Hardy Cognac, fifth generation in the family of a brand that was started in 1863. We talk about all kinds of things, the history of cognac. This is a really great lesson about how this spirit took off in the States right after the Vietnam War. These are things that I didn't know exactly. Great to dive in and great to sip through some delicious cognacs. Sip along if you can. There's some real special marks there. So without further ado, I hope you guys enjoy this great chat with Benedict Hardy. I remember that I've been in this business for too long and coming from a cognac community. For me, this is a gimmick. This is not helping the category. Yeah. I know that we want to be inspired by the whiskey industry, and the Scotch people have done that very successfully. But what you can do with barley, is, I think, is totally different than what we can do with cognac. Sure, sure. Um, cognac is wine based, and cognac has a very strict rule. And this week, not later than this week, um, the whole profession uh, unanimously said that they didn't want to go that direction to mm. have the cherry cask, the sauterne cask, the bourbon cask, and everything. It is an eau de vie that is coming from our region, but as soon as you don't respect the fact that we have been doing that for years, which is the oak, the traditional oak, mm. and believe me, we have tried chestnut. We have tried everything else before, before the rules were set. And I have tremendous respect for our ancestors, not that I like modernity, but if they have done that, they're for good reason. Yeah. It's not improving the product. And for me, the category itself is so wonderful. You know that Victor Hugo said, called cognac the nectar of the gods. Mm. And Winston Churchill, uh, who is known to enjoy champagne, he, sure. was, he loved cognac as much. Yeah. Was a good cigar, of course, and you can even never picture him without a cigar. So, <laughs> I I think it's very nice to try to be innovative, but not at any cost yeah. and not at any price. So, in this way, I'm a very very old fashioned person. Yeah. <laughs> I like cognac the way it is. Doesn't mean that we cannot go back to the um, to the scene of bartending and mixology and try to be innovative and, and creative. But for me. Putting my VSOP cognac mm. into a cherry cask is not going to improve the product. Ah. So this is ma my main concern. It's just a gimmick to sell more. I see. And maybe because I've been there too many years, I totally respect why my, the new generation wants to build, but I'm from old roots. So yeah. for me, it doesn't add anything to the product. It feels like, and this is somewhat of a double entendre, but the French spirit itself, is to question, is to stand up for tradition. Yes. And I was looking at something you were presenting earlier on, on YouTube, right? And you with Hardy represent approximately 1% of what Hennessy does. Sure. So. And maybe less soon, sure. considering, <laughs> considering how fast they're selling. You know, yeah. I have great admiration what what they have done. I mean, all the big names in the cognac industry, without them, they have paved the way, so right. we wouldn't be here without them. Those things said, I mean, Hennessy very soon is going to be 60% of the cognac industry. Wow, global, which, right? Yeah. yeah. It's huge. And in this country particularly, which has been the country where I spend the most time over the past 30 years, I mean, I'm amazed to see how fast and, I mean, how how deep they were into the idea and, and putting in people's mouths that they don't even say, give me a cognac or give me anything. Give me honey. Yeah. Give any. me honey. Right. So I remember I was doing a tasting, was having a tasting in a, in a very nice store in New Jersey. And there was a gentleman, um, African-American, that came. And in, in his car, there was 12 bottles of Hennessy. Mm -hmm. 
So I looked at him and I was tasting my VSOP and my organic VSOP. And he said, oh, what are you tasting today? I said, well, cognac. He said, what is cognac? And I (laughs) said, well, you have only 12 (laughs) bottles. He said, that's not cognac, that's honey. Right. And so we tasted the product and he said, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to keep that for my brothers and I'm going to buy some for myself because now I know you educated me. I know what cognac is. But that tells you the success. You know, it's like, I remember when I was growing up, uh, my parents had the Frigidaire. But the Uh Frigidaire name became so generic, even though it was a brand. So that tells you the success. Like, uh, make Kleenex. Exactly. Right? Like, this kind of washes over these things. Absolutely. Give me a Kleenex. So, Hennessy has reached that status, you know, and... um, for a while in vodka, that was absolute. Sure. For a while, it was Grey Goose. Mm-hmm. Now it's Tito's. Yeah. So all these people that have succeeded in putting in their in people's brain that they are the one, well, they explain everything. Yeah, they control the narrative, and maybe even unintentionally. The good, the weird thing is, is once you kind of have your little army, mm-hmm. they spread the word for you. And That's no, true. I've talked to many people, and it's like, do you like cognac? They're like, yeah, yeah. I like, do you like brandy? Like, no, nah, I don't like brandy. Like. Mm-hmm. Okay, sorry, but <laughs> yes, it's the same thing. And so yeah. it's just there's so much education to be be done. And as I wouldn't say underdog, but as this punk rock kind of organic mentality that you have to have mm-hmm. to have a loud voice, mm-hmm. what is the way in which you get people to understand what cognac is? Which is really good today is that the bourbon explosion gave us a voice that yeah. we didn't have before. Mm. Um, the batch industry you know the small batches it became very people became enamored with that yeah. suddenly it was a small batch Pepe van winkle you couldn't get arrested with that 15 years ago sure, you're right, yeah. and now see i mean i mean it's amazing so yeah. i'm full of hope that because i'm an underdog of course and because in spite of a all the efforts you put, you need time, money, I mean, and friends right. uh, uh, to spread the good word for you. Uh, this time is coming. Um, I told everybody in a long time ago, maybe five years ago, that cognac will be the next thing. The problem with cognac is that it is intimidating for many people. What do you think that is? Because there is like a mystique around it. Mm. How do you drink cognac? Oh, you drink cognac in cold winter uh, time mm-hmm. in front of a fireplace with a beautiful dog at your at your knees and sure. and and it 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 his it has a a kind of magical uh appeal mm-hmm. that sometimes repels some people oh, and right. say well it's a little elistic to me it's or it's, maybe pretentious to some extent right? absolutely yeah, yeah. absolutely what people don't know is that before prohibition in your in your um country um it is a fact that cognac was the base of most cocktails mm-hmm. The old fashion of the world, the Sazerac of the world, the French 75 were all made with cognac. So what mixology is doing today with these young bartenders that are full of ideas and, and crazy ideas sometimes, yeah. is putting back something that was on a map much before their parents were born mm-hmm. so and grandparents. So I think it's trying, it's, it still remains, it always will be. A different category than whiskey that you can produce everywhere. Yeah. You can build a distillery overnight. In cognac, even though it's the largest vine area planted in France of one appellation, it's still limited. Yeah. Imagine today, considering that the Chinese population really loves cognacs. Um, do you imagine that one out of every thousand Chinese starts to um, drink cognac? We won't have enough. Right. So it, it is not an unlimited number of cases that we can produce. So, of course, the price will always remain higher. We are very sensitive to climate changes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's a question right now we have because right now most of the grapes we're using are Uni Blanc. And there are some very serious studies to find hybrids and that will resist the higher heat that mm-hmm. we have. Mm-hmm. All these questions come into play. And so... Um, I'm very optimistic that cognac can be the next category, but with limited numbers, of course. Right. Otherwise, it will never remain a luxury product. And in my mind, it is still a luxury product. Absolutely. There, there's something commemorative about it. You know, there's for me, drinking cognac, it, it, it does 
elevate and transcend a single season, right? Like a lot of people talk, well, it's got warm notes. I'm only going to drink it in a toddy or these kinds of things. Mm. But the crisp, refreshing nature of a sidecar, I that, mean, come on. Yes. You know, that's, that's one of my favorite, favorite things. And it just isn't quite the same without cognac, right? You can use brandy in that. But there seems to be, as we've talked about, a little bit of misunderstanding about the category and something you're teaching me history, which is beautiful. I always want to know. You're saying that really the influence towards Americans with regard to cognac was not popular culture or some people no. assume hip hop or rap culture, but it was something much actually that makes a hell of a lot more sense. And that's the Vietnam War. So tell me kind of how. But it's very interesting. You know, when I started to work in this country, uh, I was dealing with people that were somewhere. They were sometime in Vietnam. Mm. Um, white people, African-American people, and everything. And I realized very soon that um, the Vietnamese culture, which was, of course, before influenced by the French, mm-hmm. we were colonizing this, this beautiful country. And uh, the, the, the soldiers that went there, and God knows a lot of African-American soldiers were there for Vietnam War. When they come, came back, the ones that were unharmed uh, had discovered cognac as a popular drink in mixed drink. Mm. Reason why they came back to their country was this idea um, that cognac was cool. I mean, that was the drink to, mm. to have. And reason why they were start, they always mixed it with Coke or with soda or something. And um, I remember a very good friend of mine, and you cannot invent his name. He was from Chicago, and he had come from Vietnam. And he, his name was Jack Daniel, if you can't believe it. <laughs> Uh, and he was such a supporter, and he was taking me to clubs, and I was young, and I was dancing with all these guys that were wonderful, and they were all having cognac and long drinks. And he said, Benedict, to be cool today, you have to drink cognac and drive a Cadillac. Amazing. And I thought that was a wonderful thing. Yeah. And so this is how it started. So in fact, the hip-hop industry and the urban industry, I mean, young people that are drinking cognac today are just... Um, doing what their grandparents were doing. I see. You okay. see? Yeah. And so they seem to have invented the wheel, but they haven't. They basically, one way or another, they yeah. were influenced by their grandparents or parents, depending on the age. It's And it, you know what? These things kind of, they always cycle through, it, whether it's a decade or two decades. You absolutely. Know? You know, and... Because uh, sides are coming back. Sidecars are coming back. I'm telling oh, you right si- now. Oh, sidecars yeah. is really something that we're pushing with one of our products yeah. called Legend. And through legendary nights, you can have legendary sidecars. And sidecars, for particularly for women, is a fantastic entry and discovery of yeah. what cognac can be. So and, talk, absolutely. Sorry, sure. Cut you off. The, this journey has been, one, obviously a very, very lengthy one, five generations, mm-hmm. or already itself. Mm-hmm. But as we sip the first of these three and kind of start the first chapter as your career started mm-hmm. with cognac, tell me a little bit about the hearty vs well, they're hardy vs you know v, you have I, i'm sure that your audience um needs a little reminding of, of the different categories vs name came from very special that's a translate and translation the english and anglo-saxon influence is not to doubt in the cognac industry we wouldn't be where we're now without the english influence english means irish uh, scandinavian i mean Everything but French. Yeah. The French know how to make things. They don't always know how to sell them. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they keep the best for themselves. Yeah. Let's be honest. Like I the Scottish do it, people yeah. do also for their whiskey. Of course. Um, so for a long time, we didn't have VS on our labels. It was called Three Stars. Mm. And the Three Stars came because for a long time, all these people in the, in the, in the wineries, in the, in the distilleries, didn't know to write or read. Mm-hmm. But our soil is very lime, limey and shulky. So they were taking a piece of shulk on the ground. And when the cognac was just distilled and placed into a brand new barrel, they were just drawing with the, the, the shulk. They were just drawing a star. The year after second star and the third year, I mean, the second year after that, the three star, the third see. star. And they knew it was time to sell. So for a long time, VS was three star and VSOP was five stars. Mm. Okay. Well, imagine some brandy producer, um, to name one of them, Metaxa, mm-hmm. the Greek, 
came with a lot of stars on their label. Oh, that's right, yeah. And the French thought, my God, we look very weak with only three stars, five stars. Let's change to a different name. That when was nobody... this approximately? That the... That's a good point. I cannot exactly answer that. But, but year, would... years ago, right? Years like 60, ago. 60, 70, yeah, something, something like that. Like yeah. that. Yeah. Wow. And remember that the Annecy of the world Irish, the Martel of the world English, I mean, all these people, the Hine, I mean, they they had English influence so the first um, initial that came to their mind was very special uh, for VS, for three stars, or very superior old pale for mm-hmm. VSOP, which is a four-year-old by law. So these are the main categories with EXO. And EXO came from the Hennessy. Um, mm-hmm. they, ne- they even have now XXO. Mm-hmm. So because EXO category today designate 10-year-old, and XXO designate 14-year-old, and oh. they were the first one to come out with that. So they created that appellation. Um, my father happened to be a close friend to Killian Hennessy, and at uh, the time when this uh, name XO came around, uh, it was interesting to know that uh, the Fiu family that has been the same distiller family for them, they're now at the eighth generation of mm-hmm. the Fiu family, had this wonderful reserve of beautiful eau de vies. They didn't have a name to uh, designate them. They were, of course, older than VSOP. Yeah. So XO, in fact, when at the beginning meant age unknown, which means that the, the blender in his cellar um, is around, is surrounded with amazing products, and Sherry picks the one that he likes to make the blend. And they needed a name that would be much better than age unknown. Mm-hmm. So EXO meant at the beginning age unknown for X years, I you see. know. And it became for everybody extra old wow. because that was the translation that was easy for everybody. But at the beginning, it was really more like age unknown. So basically, with Napoleon, which was also a category that was invented by Courvoisier, that mm-hmm. uh, claim and rightfully so that they were the cognac that Napoleon I was drinking, um, particularly to soothe his uh, stomach ache because he had an ulcer before he turned out to cancer. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's why you have on their label on Courvoisier, you have this beautiful hat, Napoleon oh, hat see. on that. So Napoleon today remained a six-year-old. Few houses have kept Napoleon. We had a Napoleon as Hardy for a long time. My father was an admirer of Napoleon. Um, but we switched to what we call legend today, which is the in-between category for us. Mm. between VSOP and XO. So basically, that are the categories. So the VS that you are tasting, Mike, is not a two-year-old, which it should be by low, but it's a three-year-old. So I'm not going to say, and say, oh, that's an eight or ten-year-old. It would be uh, not true. Yeah. But it's a three-year-old because our blender, Michael Bouilly, his name is, um, Michael insists that before three years, the cognac has not reached his pie. I mean, it's is his best quality. So we cherry pick four of the best districts in the cognac uh, in, in, at Hardy. We only use, um, um, uh, of course, Grand Champagne, Petit, Petit Champagne, mm. Bordery, and Fambois. Uh-huh. So in this one, you have the four. After that, in some of our VSOPs, we really love the Fin Champagne style, which is the blend of only Grand and Petit. It is true for our VSOP and it is true for our XO and our 25-year-old. And over 25 years of age, it's still there are still blends, but we only use Grand Champagne oh. Cognac because we like the flavors, we like the bouquet, mm-hmm. we like we like you know it's a little masculine when it's young. Yeah. When it's blend, that's why it's blended so nicely with other. With age, that's the thing about Bordery too is that for me it's just got so much texture and guttural quality it does right like a low end to like a bass as i point to a bass guitar in the corner that's yes. kind of how it reads for me um border is said to bring a femininity to the blends and also floral notes ah. like violet yeah oh, that's yeah. what they said so there are some of these products that i like very much up to 30 years of age mm. and after that you lose that and that's where grand champagne comes along and is really in my opinion um the best growth interesting this is you know what's funny is like despite how many times people have come into town to talk about cognac 
This is the first time that they're talking about how the particular varietals are elevated with age or that they lose a bit of their nature. With well, you know, too. it's tough when you're a producer in Fin Bois yeah. to hear that Grand Champagne is better than That's what right. you do. <laughs> and there are some people that do fabulous Fin Bois, don't sure. get me wrong. It's also, you never should um, diminish the qualities of the distiller. Yeah, um, because a good distiller will get the best out of it. First of all, you have to have a quality wine, and then you have to distill right. And the beautiful... the some of these distillers are so gifted, you know, there's no question. Well, it's the way that they can paint a picture. It's mm. being a true maestro. Sure. Right. Like a chef. That's exactly it's, right. Yeah. It, it's exactly like a That's chef. It's definitely like Or a, a pastry chef or a painter. Mm-hmm, a painter you have a yeah. palette and you select the best colors. and Absolutely. So this one is really a blend of three-year-old across the board. Mm-hmm. Not two and three, but only three. And it's everything that we make in cognac at Hardy is made is you I mean is aged in brand new barrels. Yeah. So in we are, yes, it's limousine oak. Okay. Uh, you know that mostly you have uh, three forests that the the, the 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 oak can come from: Allier, Troncé, and and limousine. Um, we use limousine that have that has a larger grain. Mm-hmm. We have more evaporation, so of course the financial directors hate it because mm-hmm. more evaporation, Product and the blender loss, right? and yeah. the <laughs> blender loves it because it means more concentration and more flavor. Yeah. So that's basically the difference. So that's what you have in this VS, and after three years, I mean, we have got um, a lot of awards for that product because it's on the smoother side. Right. It's very clean on the palate. Um, I think you can, we, we balance the, you know, the generosity and the strengths of the Grand Champagne mm-hmm. with the femininity of Petit Champagne and Bordery, and Fin Bois brings texture. It's, it's very, very balanced. It's rich. This is the thing is that we always think that with whiskey and scotch, older is better. But that's not always the case. You get some different levels of complexity here, which yeah. I really, really love it. But there, here was something I was thinking about. I've talked to... Jack Teeling, for instance, who is his father started the Irish whiskey industry, yes. right? And you're fifth generation. And I asked him the same question because I always feel that if you're the daughter, you're the son, that you have this obligation to carry on the brand. But this opportunity now as a global ambassador, let's say when you were 12, let's say when you were in your teenage years, was this something that was on your mind that you would have to carry this Legacy? Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> I think I, I resented some time that my parents had so many visitors constantly. My mother was an amazing chef, and she was always welcoming all these people, all these dignitaries from everywhere. And in a way, I resented what what my children are going to now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I was lucky enough to enjoy school. So I went to law, and I, I was admitted to a good university, and ultimately became a lawyer. And this is in Geneva? This is in Geneva yeah. for maritime law. And, what, uh, now, that's a very, because it's so interesting, some people, environmental law, you know, the criminal law, but what was it about maritime The law, law of the seas, ah. which means, you know, imagine all the reserve of, between countries. Uh, you won't be surprised that the United States own one of the largest with all the islands and everything um, of the territories and the possibility to dig very deep to get all the gold, the of course, oil. Yeah. and everything. But France is number two. Oh, I didn't know that. We have so many islands all over the world that it cre- creates. And we can today feed the world uh, with what is in, in the oceans if, really? we are, if we are really careful. We have not discovered, you know, everybody's talking about going to the moon. Right. I promise you that if we study the ocean right and if we save our oceans, there will be no hunger on this planet. Where did that passion for, not necessarily maritime law, but just water and the seas itself, where did that start? Well, it's funny because I had, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to become. I major in political sciences and... In, within the, France? Within going? France, yes, in Bordeaux. And I... And I didn't like politics, <laughs> so <laughs> I was supposed to be married to somebody else, and uh, and and our engagement broke off, and I took a year off, and I wander, and I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I 
I went around with my father and I loved what he was doing, but at the same time, I wanted to finish what I had committed to finish. Yeah. And there was a, a teacher, and when I was admitted, I, I, I passed the exam for Columbia University, uh -huh. which at the time, Harlem was not exactly the safest place to study, as uh -huh. you can imagine. So I chose a university in, in Geneva, Switzerland, because I'm a, an avid skier also, uh -huh. so very selfishly, I wanted to enjoy life. <laughs> <laughs> what else is wrong when you're 25 yeah. or less? And uh, And... I had, I had, I sat down at uh, this university and there was a teacher that was, uh, his name was Lucius Kefalish and he was absolutely mesmerizing. Mm. So in fact, I chose maritime law because he was in charge, <laughs> <laughs> not because of passion, but because this guy was totally amazing yeah. and he could, he has a charisma that I have rarely seen. He was a, a Dutch Swiss, you know, oh, uh, yeah. and, uh, and he was very interesting and, uh, and he, I really never regretted and never looked back. But when I finished and I was ready to start, I mean, in that field, uh, I, I thought that was that was a little overwhelming for me. I don't know. I I, mm. I really got cold feet and so about, went back. Like, like about entering the professional world. Yes. Uh. Yes, and because you'd have to deal with some cases with insurance and everything, yeah. and you discover that. Human nature is not exactly as pink and rosy as you would imagine. Right. So, you know, having to deal with people that sink boats to get the insurance money and you have to defend those cases was really tough on me. Yeah. So maybe because I was kind hearted or I don't know, maybe weak. I don't know. You call it the way you want. It was it was tough. So I came back to my dad and I said, I'm going to be in the wine business. He said, what? <laughs> After 10 years, you're going to be in the wine business? I said, yes. You know, I would love to work for... Mrs. Mancinopoulos, the owner of Margot, because uh -huh. she's really carrying the torch of a lady that has so much charisma and, and everything. And he said, have you ever thought about cognac? And I said, I don't even like cognac. I was 26 year old. Really? No, what I was is, not. That what? was very interesting. We were drinking wine. Uh -huh. I had had cognac before, but I was, I was, you know, I was prejudiced in the sense that I only wanted to drink old cognacs. I see. So I said, I'm no, yeah. I know, I know. <laughs> and so I said, he said, well, if I teach you, um, and he became my mentor. And so I said, well, but I have to cherry pick. I don't want to work in Japan. I don't want, because at that time, 30 years ago, a lady's voice could not be heard. I mean, right. it was very difficult. And he said, so which country would you like to work in? I said, the United States, because I already love your country so much and he said my god it's not the united states for alcohol he said benedict every state has a different state oh, of law right, right. he said you're gonna have to suffer i said well i like a challenge when i see one so let's do that and i started this way you know as a wanted to show my father that i could do something and god knows i made so many mistakes i cried so many times i trusted people that i shouldn't have trusted yeah. and that's how you learn, and you pick up the pieces, and you start all over again. The, you know, you make a, so actually to tie this back to Lynette. Lynette was with you in Portland. She was. Yeah. So, yeah. speed rack, Lynette's movement. You know, yeah. she's done so much to, I think, allow women bartenders to feel united. Right. There's, yes. There's so many things. It's hard because it's you know as a as a guy talking about this thing, but you've seen this industry change profoundly from a very very French. And a very, very female perspective. Two yeah. very unique ones. Yeah. So now, 30 years later, roughly, are we in a better place? Yes, you are. You are in a better place. And <laughs> taste-wise, my God. I remember when I came with my father in 1981, where we were selling the most expensive cognac at the time, mm. called Perfection, the cognac my great-great-grandfather, and we did a tour with that. People were drinking milk. Was there was there uh, was there meal? What? Oh, yeah. that's so strange. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> telling you, uh, not everybody, of course, but some. And yeah. after that, they went to White Zinfandel. Oh yeah, slightly oh, better. Yeah. Uh, Coke, of course, sure. yes, they're still very prominent. And now, when I see people in in a in the restaurant, and your food scene is yeah. really amazing, and I don't think education and, and enjoyment of these refined spirits could have happened without the refinement that you have in food today. I think it goes hand to hand. I agree, yeah. Um, 
I think your population has changed drastically in the past 20 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, you're still trendy. You like things, and some days will disappear as fast as they were grown. But yeah. on on the basics and the you know the cabernets of the world, I mean, the the merlots, the chardonnay, the sauvignon blanc, you have discovered that too much oak is not that good. Right. For a long time, you called buttery something that was not drinkable. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but you learned. You learned very fast. And that's what I like this country so much. And you're not afraid of asking questions, which mm -hmm. is something Europeans don't do. You assume that the French know about cognac? No. <laughs> they don't know more than you do. It's, it's actually really interesting. <laughs> I, w I, w I always assume when I go to Paris that yeah. everybody's going to be like, oh, yeah, let's drink some Calvados. People, they're like, oh, we don't really have any. I'm like, but this is the na yeah. one of the national spirits. Yeah, but you have to remember that ninety six percent of cognac is exported. That's right. Yeah, that's a great point. People, people drink more Armagnac, I guess, in France. Yeah. Uh, Calvados was very popular in the sixties and seventies. You know, when you finished your coffee, you were just putting a little touch of Calvados or Armagnac <laughs> or cognac into your warm cup. That is not a bad. Living. No, that's that is nice. not. That's pretty nice. <laughs> So, um, so even some people, you know, don't, I have, I know some people in Cognac, I mean, in France, I don't know Cognac is a city. That's really. And Cognac is the sister city of a, of a Texas city. You know that, Denison, Texas. Because of the vines? Because, because of, of the Loxera, vines. Right? Because yeah. of Phylloxera, because of a gentleman by the name of Munson that mm -hmm. was born in Denison, Texas, and he's the one that overcame the hurdle of having our vines disappear left and right yeah. with that disease. And he invented and created the resistant root stock. You know, in this country, everybody believes that UC Davis is the one that you have to turn to for wine industry mm -hmm. and business. Without Denison, there would be no wine in France, yeah. Spain, Italy. I mean, what we went through at the end of the 19th century is not conceivable. Yeah. Well, 20, 20 years ago, I remember um, Mondavi was burning their vineyards to the ground because they had phylloxera attacks. Oh, and now, it's, I mean, poor Australia mm. is, if you, if you look online, you'll see that they have some boats of uh, phylloxera themselves. Oh, wow. So it's not something that we have a cure for except burning the vineyards to the ground. And God knows Australia doesn't need any more fire yeah. than they do now, have now. But without Denison, and you know, I know in Cognac people, you know, say, do you know why Denison is our sister? They don't even know. So That's even in our Cognac business, I'm sure you can ask many of my colleagues and some of the young ones yeah. don't know. Are you, I know that because I was born there yeah. and well, nearby, Angoulême. But, but anyway, I was taught these things and my uncle became the mayor of the city of Cognac and stayed the mayor for 20 years. No, and he's the one that organized the sister city thing with Denison. That's incredible. And when we had a, a very bad hurricane in Cognac in 1999, which we never had in our history ever before, the first check that came to my uncle was the mayor of Denison. No way. Yes. That's and, great. And even the kids of the school, the public school system, yeah. made a collect of money and send us money to build trees, to replant trees. I mean, I mean some some of these things are to, so moving. Yeah. So that's why we have a special, I mean, place in our heart. It's incredible. For Texas. Yeah, and it, what's a good, you know, Texas is quite a fine state. At it. Texas yeah. has everything. It does. Except really does. maybe, well, you, you even have the the, 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 the seas, and you have uh -huh. the ocean too. So you have everything. That's you it. have the desert, you have the forest, you have the amazing cities. I, I haven't been in Dallas for quite a while. I was... I was there with Jessica here, and that we had, I was admiring all these buildings. Mm -hmm. You're very daring and gorgeous, and Austin is a uh, is booming city. Oh, Everybody great. talks about Austin. So, I mean, I'm very, I'm very um, happy to be here, yeah. really. That's one that's always good to have, you know, cognac representing in Austin. <laughs> I love that. You know, we, when you talk about this illustrious 30-year career, talking about making mistakes, Talking lots, about lots of mistakes. Which is the best? <laughs> which is the best thing you can do? Was there ever a point where you're thinking, okay, I know that my dad and I talked about this thing, and I know I'm out here in the states trying to do it, but I, I just don't know if I can do this anymore. 
It's funny you say that. I had signed with um, an importer um, in 89, and without the spirit manager of that importer, I would probably would have left the industry. Mm. Because at the time, this importer was not doing justice to my brand, and I thought, that's my fault. I'm not good at it, and I we could do better. And this guy said, Benedict, you're good at what you're doing. It's only that these people don't listen. Mm. So he left this company, and we formed the Hardy USA together. No kidding. And that's the reason why I really persevered. And, and yes, and his name was Bill Walsh, and I had tremendous respect for him. He became a friend. I, he's retired now, and now I'm with... Uh, Another corporation that I have tremendous respect for, the Levesque yeah. Corporation oh, yeah. out of uh, um, California that I've known for many years. And when the Hardy USA a situation was not doing well because Bill was gone and his partner was not exactly doing what I thought was good for the brand, I mean, the Levesque stepped in and we have great expectations of what uh, what cognac can can grow that's well cool. except that we're waiting for a tax as you know um, we'll talk about that yeah, yeah. yeah. you know that's, yeah. A, that's a huge pain in the ass for everybody and you know even, our, even for the people selling of course i mean it's, it's serving it's it def- selling it importing it all of that yes. you know it's just a yes. hu- it's a shit show and it yeah we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it because we'll talk about the future here in a second yes and that's you know i try to be nice to everybody if they don't like me that's okay that's fine. But I'm not going to slap their hand with tax because they don't treat me like I think I need to be treated. Mm-hmm. You know, this is fucking ridiculous. Yeah, it's to tough. It's expect tough. a country to support one's ego. And if they don't, you're going to pay for it, quite mm. literally. Mm. But I want to talk about inspiration. I want to talk about creativity here. There are so many elements to the terroir of France and cognac. There's so, so much artistry whether it's painting whether it's music serge gainsbourg right or whether it is <laughs> movies but one of the things you know jessica had she was she reached out to me she's like i've got this new bottle that it, it's beautiful it's this new kind of it's not necessarily a collaboration but it's this new product and it's got this thoughtfulness behind it so this second piece as we talk about the present what inspired you with and how to create hardy legend i think first of all the name came from a brainstorm inside the company within the company that we wanted to give um my great great grandfather um who was a legend really in our industry and my grandfather as a matter of fact and my father they were all strong men you know Mm -hmm. and so the name legend came from the fact that we're very thankful that they started this business and that they they restarted that after the second world war yeah um how, uh, how long, real quick, just because of the mm-hmm. history piece, so 1863, things start to kind of take form, but it, it was a closed house, or you weren't producing for a period of time? Yes, we were producing for a period of time, and after that, in a, in a, in a little area called Le Drogue, and uh, my, my grandfather sold that, and because at the time he considered that being a negotiant like we were, and being a producer was two different businesses. Oh, okay. that, was, that was his opinion at the time. Um, well, you have to understand that really uh, the First World War, I was lucky that my grandfather came back unharmed and mm. started to collect for himself. This is the reason why the third cognac that you will have, uh, it dates back, back from his collection, private collection. Legend came around because we needed something that was at the same time very feminine, which is really something mm. that we wanted to emphasize, not because I sell it, but because we wanted a cognac that was easy on the palate. Mm. Um, and we wanted a bottle. So we commissioned a designer, a friend of mine, a young guy called Sébastien Servet out of Paris. And the guy loved the rooster idea. Oh, okay. Uh, and he wanted to picture something that was, you know, the symbol of these two um, wings that you have on that bottle oh, are see. like the rooster that sure. shows his, just spread his wings. So that's how it came around. And every time we present this bottle, everybody says, oh, my God, it is so beautiful. Yeah. And it's tough to get everybody's approval, but I must say that this bottle have gained a lot of uh, uh, success and, and support. And you had this great showing for the competition in Portland, too. Yes. So how does, how does that feel? You know, because you have these ideas. Maybe you're sitting in the office. Maybe you're sitting on the beach. I don't know. But <laughs> yeah, that happens. Not very often, but that does happen. But you think, like, what's what's next? What what else? What How can we share this Well, I was thing? inspired by... 
of course, my my great competitors. Um, Remy has a beautiful product called 1738. Oh, right, right. Uh, which is exactly that. This is the in-between category VSOP and XO. So for people that don't want to spend $150 or more or less for a bottle of XO, it's in between um, a step above VSOP and just a step underneath XO. So we wanted something that would be a little more affordable, but still will give, will have many uses, mm-hmm. including cocktail. And so the name legend came with a campaign that Levesque embraced and built legendary nights. Yeah. And that's how we, we built it. And we decided that Oregon would be a nice um, launching, uh, I would say, of that concept. And we had six of these uh, successful bartenders and mixologists that came. And the lady, Lauren, who, who won, is from Washington, D.C., and she's coming to visit us. That was the prize. Yeah. With, uh, uh, this was uh, a price for two, and so she's coming at the end of June to visit us. And for me, that was really important. First of all, she's an African-American lady, which was totally, uh, of course, the selection was not made on that criteria, but it was uh, very nice because yeah. being from two minorities, you know, being a woman and for African-American and to be that successful. And she was a nurse at the mm. beginning. Wow. Go figure. And she really created a very interesting cocktail. And so I'm happy to have her discover with us and our people how we make cognac, how we age it, and to see what, what we all do. And it's not only hardy. I mean, a lot of people now are very creative with cognac. And we go back to the roots. As I told you before, the prohibition, a lot of cocktails were made with that. Yeah. So, and you see, not only cognac, but but a lot of other um Eau de vies, liqueurs are back. You know, Sue's had disappeared from sure, the face sure. of the earth. You have... Dubonnet yeah, is back. Right? Dubonnet, yeah, Dolan. I mean, uh-huh. the, the wonderful vermouth. I mean, you name it. I mean, yeah. you have so many. And they're beautiful. Even Pinot that we do. Oh, yes. Pinot the Deschamps. Pinot des Chantes, oh, which is stuff. a terrible name. But if you don't you feel drink. Lille, look uh-huh. at the success of Lille. I mean, and so... The mixology world is really giving us a hand in that way. So for Legend, that was really the idea. And in Legend, you have Petit Champagne. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have Baudry and Fambois, mm. the three, the three ones. Uh, again, the youngest in the blend is four years, but the oldest is 12. So not everything like the VS is three, but it's a blend of different eau de vies of different ages. And this is really the creation of Michael, our blender. And when we sat down and tasted the result, I think we were thrilled that he would be such a good quality to offer to our, our customers. It's, I like scotch. Mm-hmm. I like bourbon, mezcal. These are all very, very different categories. Mm-hmm. But there's something still so special about cognac that if you taste the right sip at the right time, mm-hmm. there's really nothing more beautiful than that. Thank you. Do you feel it? Does it trend? It's two things. One thing that I thought, I think this is a really cool tip, and I had never heard this before. We talk about blase, and we talk about caramel coloring and stuff mm-hmm. like that. You said there's one way to actually discern if there's caramel additive in the <laughs> cognac. Tell, I, I think that this is the first time I heard this. This is a super cool thing. Um, that was something that my old blender told me. Uh, he said, you just put a drop in your okay. hands. If your hands stick, there's caramel. If they don't, there is none. Yeah. That's so and, crazy. you know, there's nothing wrong in using boise as long as it's allowed by law and everything. I know that our blender, the fact that he buys close to 800 new barrels a year, mm. bring us enough color. I mean, if you come and visit us, which I hope you will, mm. um, Mike, um, when, I mean, Michael is very honest in showing everything that he can offer. And so he shows you the eau de vie when it's just distilled at yeah. full strength. And then he is telling you that he doesn't put this eau de vies at 140 proof and brand new barrels. He immediately add distilled water to it. Ah, okay. He's using water as an aging factor instead of a diluting factor sure, that will sure. be used at the end of the life. And that makes a big difference. So not everybody has the room, the money, um, not that we're that rich, no, don't get me wrong, but, <laughs> but, but it's true that we invested in the right things and we don't cut corners. Yeah. And so, um, caramel, 
in the future, I mean, as we will talk about the future, you know that on food now you have labels telling you what is in the food mm. but it's coming for for wine and spirits it's well, coming I, I hope so I, and again i it's just aesthetics you know yeah but yeah. i could no because something's they, dark you know it doesn't you know n- no and the fact that people think that because it's dark it's old right if you come to my office my father left me around 60 bottles behind just behind my desk that are the same old cognac bottle, but different colors and everything. Different. Uh, he left me a map of what is what, 1906, 1922, yeah. and all kind of stuff. None of them really has the same color. Which is great. And I have a 1922, for instance, which is much lighter in color that that's a much younger one, yeah. which is different because Mother Nature doesn't do things for everybody the same. That's right. You know, and you're born with a good health. You're born mm. with a bad health. I mean, we're not equal. Yeah. Uh, there is nothing more wrong than equality because, because unfortunately, you see that every day. There is nothing equal about a kid having brain tumor or something. Right, right. But in cognac, that's the same story. Some of them are grown to become exceptional and some other will never be that exceptional. Mm-hmm. So the, the art of blending is really something that I really treasure. We have a few uh, vintages some of them are exceptional some other are mediocre sure and so if you go that way and become a, a, a vintage house fine it's nice for people to see their wedding date anniversary their birthday date and everything as far as the quality in cognac for mm. me it doesn't apply because you don't need a blender then yeah. just put and lock under lock and keys this cognac let him let him sit of course, make sure you refill the barrels with the same product so the barrels don't dry up and mm-hmm. lose everything. The keys also hold by the administration, and we have a few of those. But for me, the art of blending, which is exactly what Martel says in their logo, the art of blending, yeah. is really key. So the blender makes all the difference in the world. And I know my cold taste. I don't know many cognacs every week. Tasting, in our words, is mostly done with the nose. Right. He drinks very little. He puts a drop under his tongue, but the nose is really what re- really brings the, the the product. That's how we see if the product is right or not. Yeah. Well, it's so distinctly attached to nostalgia too, our mm-hmm. sense of mm-hmm. smell. Yeah. Before we kind of conclude and enter this last chapter, this last act, because I always think of three act. Play. I don't know why we're going. <laughs> we're just going cl- three act. Yeah, three act play. Right. Four. This just gets a little complicated. Right. But for you, you keep innovating, you keep creating these new just aesthetics with this glassware, you're mm-hmm. commissioning artists to kind of think about things in a different way. It's really very artful in itself. But in terms of inspiration for you, what are some things that really encourage you to think differently or that you can go to to push the brand forward? Um. Let's say that my father started that with the help of um, two gentlemen from New York that came and visited us in 1980 and was were sent at the big. They wanted at the beginning to put a champagne in a very artistically made crystal bottle, mm-hmm, which of course mm-hmm. is not allowed by the champagne and everything. They could have the empty bottle of uh, uh, the empty glass or crystal, but they couldn't put, of course, a champagne in that. And at the time, they were visiting Oreo uh, Champagne Company. And the Oreo family was a friend of my dad. And they said to him, no, we're not to them. We cannot do the champagne project with you, but you should select a very old cognac to do that. Why don't you go and visit um, Jacques Hardy, my father, and ask him to taste Grand Pas Reserve, which was the name of my great-great-grandfather, special reserve so when they showed up at my father's doorstep and told him mr ario sent us and this is what we would like to taste and this is the project we have my father said okay and we tasted this two person their name was uh, uh, sam aaron and, and mark platt and they were from if i'm not mistaken sherry lehman mm-hmm. from uh, new york and they were in love with this product but of course grandpa reserve was not exactly the right name and because the only word that came to their mouth was perfect. It's perfect. It's perfect. My father named it perfection. Wow. But in order to, they already had a, 
a beautiful decanter in mind with Dome Crystal Company. And that's how it started. We realized that promoting something very rare and very expensive needed to have a special bottle, a special yeah. um, design or something. So my father was really the first one. And my sister, when she joined the, the company before I did, who was an art major, uh, continue in that field. And we continue to promote artistically designed crystal bottles because we needed something to differentiate ourselves mm -hmm. from the rest of the world. And now, we at the time, in 1981, when I did the tour of the United States with my dad and these two gentlemen, the cognac was selling for $3,700, $3,750 exactly. Yeah. And everybody thought we were crazy. Now, when you see, when you look at those prices, I mean, piece of cake. I mean, how much is Scotch whiskey today right, compared yeah. to that? But we persevered and we, we continued to promote things that nobody else was doing. So we continued with Dome Crystal Factory. And my dream was to work with Lalique. And ah, this yes. is something that I did at the, recently, around eight years ago. It took me a while to convince. First of all, the Lalique family didn't want to have anything but perfume in their, in their bottle. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Um, I don't know if Mrs. Lalique had had an alcohol problem or any kind, but she was really reluctant to use that. Uh, there was a, a cognac house that did that before, a Chateau Paulé, um, but they, did, they didn't have enough audience at the time to really make it a success. But they were the first one, and we were only the second one. And, uh, and Courvoisier had one as well. But we basically today are the only one dealing with Lalique and with his new owner, Silvio Dance, a very, very successful entrepreneur and charming man mm. from Switzerland. And he was in the perfume business, sold his uh, chain of perfumania, perfume uh, businesses, and invested in, in Lalique. And since he has done that, I mean, he has created so many jobs and so many dreams come true. Um, and it's an honor for me to work with him. So we decided to go with uh, something very unique we did the five elements with Dome, mm -hmm. and we created the four seasons with uh, Lalique. So we did uh, spring, uh, summer, and autumn, which is the most recent one, and winter will come next winter. Interesting. Uh, with different colors, and really what we want to emphasize is, the, of course, the quality of the products. Because those cognacs date back for the youngest, um, 1939. And for the oldest, 1918, when my grandfather came back from the First World War unharmed. That's incredible. So those batches were put together, and we were kept, of course, in the cellar. And uh, Michael, our blender, uh, made the four season at once, in the sense that in using different proportions of these different eau de vies, he made the different style more floral for, for spring, more honey and apricot for, for uh, uh, summer, more cinnamon and orange rind for uh, autumn uh, and more wood and structure and, and earthiness to winter. That's incredible. So they're all different. Yeah. And when you come and visit us, it is our pride and joy to make you sit down with us and taste them side by side. I mean, it sounds like a horrible thing. They're very, very <laughs> tough, very tough. And so, it's funny to see that people, according to their knowledge, according to their taste and what they drink, have different opinion. Yeah. My favorite is autumn. But I had a discussion with a friend of mine in Las Vegas, which is a good market for us for luxury, uh, probably particularly the MGM Corporation. Mm -hmm. uh, and and this one loved the summer. Huh. And right now there is a, a casino in in California in San Bernardino that is doing the most expensive. Um, cocktail in using printemps, the spring, in it. So everything's possible. It's yeah. it's just a matter of taste, and your taste is based upon your knowledge and what you like. So yeah. my truth is not your truth, which is really the most beautiful thing Absolutely. about it. Our journeys are different. Yes. They are littered with other kinds of suffering, but also other kinds <laughs> of opportunities and yes. all of that. You know? Yes. So this last chapter yes. is this aforementioned autumn yeah which is i mean this is incredible 1939 is the youngest 
yes, in 1919 the, is the oldest? 19, is that 1918. 18, okay. Um, at the time, um, he was engaged. I'm not sure he was already married, my, my grandfather, but he, was, came, he came back from the war, from the First War, which was, well, there is no good war, but right. the First War in Europe was horrendous. You know, many young men never came back. So the women... The reason why we still have some 1914 that we call the women's cognac, because when the men left for war, women were left to tend the vineyards, to distill and everything. Right. So it's considered a very feminine one for these four years that basically women distilled. Yeah. So yes, those those products are, and he only put aside the one that he liked best. Yeah. And we kept them, we hid them <laughs> during the war, as you can imagine. I was lucky enough that I have some um, inside information because my grandfather, this man, was the right hand of the current, the mayor at the time, and he spoke German. And uh, because he spoke German, because Germany was a big country for Cognac at the time, um, he convinced the German to create, to uh, uh, like an organization, the BNIC, that uh -huh. would protect the Appalachian and defend. Remember that the Germans never thought they would lose the war. Yeah. And of course, distillation stopped for a while, and when it resumed, it's only because uh, Mr. Klebisch, who was the guy in charge of the, the, the German authority there, understood that uh, he could not stop the distillation and hope to have cognac a few years from, uh, from now. So. Yeah. If you have a very nice book to read about what France went through during the war, not so much about cognac. We were, we were lucky to have somebody that have some understand, that had some understanding. Um, you have to read Wine and War, mm. uh, which was written by two American journalists, a couple, uh, the Clatstrup. And uh, this is a wonderful book that tells you everything what we went through. Did you ever see Army of Shadows? Yes, which is a brilliant portrayal of the German occupation of France. That, yes. that for because I'm more, I, you know, I get really I love film. Yes. Jean Pierre Melville. Melville, right? yes, yeah. and it, it's accurate though, right? It is. Yeah. It is mostly accurate. Yes. Yeah. Melville wanted to portray exactly the truth, so some regions were spared and some others were not. Yeah. And Champagne was probably the most looted. That's I, I had no idea. Well, even though Hitler didn't drink much, he didn't drink at all, barely. He had a hatred for all the um, German companies, German names and families that left Germany to settle mm. in the Champagne region. The Bollinger, the Tettinger, the, uh, which was the real pronounced, the way, the German way, the Deutz. I mean, all these people, and he considered because he was the superior race, what were they doing with those French people? Yeah. He never understood the terroir, he never understood these things. So looting them was a revenge. I see. You well, see. ego, again. Yeah. You know what? And this is the perfect time to talk about tariffs. <laughs> you talk about a leader of a country, no names, of course, but no. really having been offended by another country and taking it out on them. This tariffs or these proposed tariffs on French spirits, there's some other things too. The Mexico and, might and, go through some and, of this. and, you know, and it's against the Scotch whiskey. That's, that's the, right, the, yeah. The Italian cheese. I mean, you name it. I mean, we are, we are just the hostages of um, a, a war that is not our war. Um, it's between Airbus and Boeing. And it's sad that um, everybody is trying to get as much product as possible right now just yeah. to avoid that. We should know how much we're going to be taxed on January 15th, but everything on the water before February 15th will not, should not be taxed. So, yeah. well, Hennessy is always a leader, and Hennessy has been working on bringing a lot of products in this country. I guess they have more information than we did. Yeah. Um, that's what you have when you're a leader. Um, but the other companies are going to be hurt drastically. Some people might be out of business. Yeah, it's a very Because the United market. States remained the number one market. As far as my company is concerned, yeah, it is. Yeah. It's no question. So it won't, we, we hope it was not going to last. But we have been through that before. I mean, I remember in the 70s uh, when I, w I could listen to my dad complaining about the fact that we we were taxed by the United States because we didn't want to import uh, chicken that was raised with hormones. Mm -hmm. So it was called the chicken war, la guerre du poulet at the time. And we were also 
struck by attacks by Hong Kong and, and because we didn't want to import their fake watches and everything, which now they're not doing that. But So Cognac, seem, because it's such a big export for France, seems to be the primary target, like Scotch whiskey is yeah. the primary target. You understand that? So it's very unfortunate. I don't think that this kind of war has to... I mean, I don't think American public is really understanding everything and we even us we don't but yeah. well it's it's a matter of la- a fa- that's a fact that we have to deal with and get organized and helping our importer to get enough products to avoid that unfair tax i and i think things i think it'll be fine i do you know because it's uh, as much as it was a from the hip kind of motion or kind of gesture which mm-hmm. i think was because of personal grievances between two people Mm -hmm. you know i think that it will be course corrected pretty quick too i hope i hope well listen there was a um a very nice article that was published by zaki's which is the one of the in westchester new york which is one of the largest french wine seller uh i mean really and they have done justice to the french wine and to a tremendous account and they were trying to convince their the, the the you know, the senators of the world, mm. uh, the congressmen that they that represent their area said, you cannot allow that. It's it's crazy. You have to put a, a, a stop to that. Yeah. How many people are going to be out of business? And So hopefully it won't last. Yeah. Um, and it's always unfortunate, but we, you know, Cognac will recover. Yeah, right. <laughs> Some smaller company might be hurt. That's yeah. no question. I mean, it, there is always damages. There was always what we call collateral damage. Right. We're trying our best not to be the one hurt, but, you know, it's a risk. Well, I'll tell you this. You know, we s- sipped this autumn blend from mm. ages ago. Mm-hmm. And if only we could sit down at the table and negotiate when we're drinking cognac. <laughs> that would help. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, that it, would change like, everything. Okay, okay I, <laughs> yes. fine, fine. I agree <laughs> that this is going to change. And the power of this spirit in this particular sip specifically it's so balanced and it it pulls you to these different places you know i've I've had the privilege of sipping so many amazing spirits but trying something of this age even if i didn't know it was this old it takes you into those cellars it takes you into the part of history it it feels like that yes it's a part of history it's very privileged well you have to understand that you're tasting something that only 400 people will be able to buy in the world Oh wow! There were only four hundred units each. Yeah. Well, we we did. He had made enough for five hundred liters of each season, and of course, everything else is used to taste yeah. customers and do tastings and everything. But um, again, uh, you cannot pretend that it's that old and oh, and I have unlimited numbers. It wouldn't be yeah. right to the category and right to the story of the house. So mm. it's rare, and that's really something that we. We will continue because we're lucky enough to have old reserves yeah. and we want to like these projects. We want to make those projects with very, very interesting names. I have a, a, a project with an Italian. Um, I'm very open. I'm very European this way. And <laughs> <laughs> I, I like people that are creative, yes. that are daring, and then that's what art comes into play. That's you know, incredible. So. There is a very huge intersection between art and artistry here. Yes. The distillation and mm. the creation of these vessels. I strongly are. believe our distillers are artists. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, they, they do things right. Absolutely. And you have now a lot of ladies. When I started in this business, ladies were very rare. You yeah. know, you had Mrs. Ayer Dubois for Remy, who was exceptional. Still is. She's still mm-hmm. alive. Poor lady. Uh, but... Um, uh, you had Mrs. Cointreau, you had, I mean, amazing, you know, of course, Vouf, Clico, and yeah. all these people that have been in our industry. But women were a minority. Now it's not as true. And in as far as people doing, basically making cognac, a lot of women now are, in, are really coming to play. And that, that's, that's, that's a wonderful news. It's incredible for me because it's a difference of insight, a difference of, Emotion, a difference of sure. the way that we're made. Intuition. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's all it is. So I've got two questions left for you. You know, I'm really happy that you're in Texas doing, you were, were in Dallas last night, despite it snowing in Dallas, which I don't know how you <laughs> caught that one, but, and then you're in Austin tomorrow. Are you doing San Antonio? You guys yes, San Antonio? we're going to San Antonio, and before that, we'll be in Houston. What can we expect? There's a great event tomorrow at the Fairmount, is that right? 
Yeah, Fair amount, yes. Yeah. Interesting. What it, what's an event like with Benedict? Well, it's very simple. Um, most of the time, people ask me questions. Um, I'm amazed by the amount of curiosity that yeah. there is behind, because as I told you, cognac was very poorly explained by many of my, by my competition, maybe. So I'm, I'm not saying that I have the ultimate science of everything, but I tell the story like I just told you. Yeah. And people fall in love or don't fall in love with a product. It's just a matter of taste buds. Mm-hmm. But also the fact that they understand better when it comes from, I think that's, that's really what the event is all about. So we taste people. At the same time, we explain what cognac can be so wonderful in cocktails, yeah. which is for most of them. Uh, yesterday night, we were at that uh, uh, very nice place, uh, Club Corp, and uh, yes, Down Club? Tower Club, oh, tower sorry, Club. Tower Club, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, sorry. And beautiful lady there, Keisha, and she knows cognac inside and out, and mm. it's such an honor to be there and, and taste people. And uh, we tasted, she had a party of 90 people. And wow. out of them, they stopped by, they were looking at our bottles. And I, I said, you should have a Sazerac with cognac. And they looked at me like, really? And one of the guys said, okay, give me one. So we poured of our some of our VS in it. And he said, that's amazing. Yeah, that's great. That that made my evening. Yeah, you know? that's, one, that's one of those cheat codes yes. that, that you do a split base with a yes. Sazerac or just use entirely brand, you know, yes. cognac. It's an amazing thing. So that's that's what you can expect when you when you see me. And uh, if you need some information on how cognac is made, how we age it, and about our blender, and about what how we see the future of cognac. I mean, I'm trying to give my vision. I mean, it's I'm hoping my daughter will be the sixth generation. Wow. She doesn't know yet. She's only 21, <laughs> and Spoiler she's alert, she's a rebel. <laughs> I mean, at the, at her age, I had no clue that yeah. I would join the business. So how can I? ask her to do that so that's 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 basically what you can see when we can do these tastings it's wonderful say magnifique no oh, yeah see <laughs> so the last question i have for you we've been sipping you know again i'm biased i really love cognac i love the category the flavors are really they just they hit me mm-hmm. in a very very heartfelt way you know yeah. not everything does that I, mm-hmm. I love bourbon but it, it, it seldom does it feel as the depths, and, the that's depths. right. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So let's say you're sipping this autumn release mm-hmm. with anybody, living or deceased. Who would you love to just sit down, have a conversation with, and sip this beautiful cognac? There's so many great people that I like. Um, General de Gaulle is mm. probably one, and his best and worst enemy, Churchill. I have tremendous <laughs> uh, respect for Churchill. I think he was the greatest man yeah. of the 20th century, in my opinion. Um, the way he, he uh, I was, I was amazed by the movie *The Darkest Hour*. Um, yeah, Gary Oldman's great. Right? My yeah. God, I think uh, the actor was absolutely mm-hmm. mesmerizing, and the fact that Churchill really kept his country. I mean, and took it. I mean, and saved. Um, really, yeah. I think so. Churchill will, be, will probably be my choice, and my father, who is deceased, I would like him to taste that again with me. Yeah, you guys <laughs> got to sip cognac together. Yeah. Yes, we did. Many times. But he was a Scotch drinker. Can really? you believe it? Are you yes. kidding? Me? No, he was. <laughs> <laughs> he. We were the first importer of Highland Park. Are you kidding me? No, but no we were way. so small that they left us. <laughs> uh. <laughs> but we still like it. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. Benedict, it's been just a pleasure, and never before have I been able to understand the world of cognac in this way. <laughs> through it's this because lens. it's a horse's mouth, as my father would have said. Yeah. It's coming from people born there. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible, and yeah. I feel it. I feel it in this room with you. I feel it through every sip of these bottles, and it's just been a pleasure. Thank you so much for doing this. You're welcome. Thank you, Mike. And we will, you know, we're gonna see more of you. We're gonna see more. Yeah, I, I hope. I haven't yeah. been in Texas for quite a while. It's only because Jessica is now with me and yeah. she's pushing me to do things that I'm happy. You know, it's difficult for but the most difficult thing for me is to find enough time for everybody. Yeah. You live in a continent. Everybody. <laughs> them, so people say, why do you spend so much time in the United States? I say, because you put nearly two friends in Texas. That's right. Does that ring a bell? So <laughs> I'm, when I'm in New Jersey, I'm not in California. You know, yeah. you have, and they say, oh, you're always in the United States. Well, the United States is huge. Yeah. 
So you want you want to give justice to everybody. And, I, and I appreciate you. You know, it's a Sunday afternoon. I can't imagine drinking cognac with a better, <laughs> better group of people. So there is no bad day to drink cognac. It's not a good yeah. day. It's every day. Yeah. You know? And and in our business, we don't have weekends. We don't know what the mean the <laughs> weekend <That's> means. Right. <laughs> <laughs> because it's always a, an opportunity to talk, to talk yeah. to people like you. It's thank been you. Just a pleasure. Thank you as well. It's <laughs> been just remarkable. And I'll see you guys probably see you tomorrow. If not, we'll get. A cocktail or, or an eight. So that's perfect. A, li- a little sidecar. That's oh, with yeah. legend. We call it legendary sidecar. Sidecardito. Right? <laughs> Sidecardito. <laughs> that's the Spanish influence in you. <laughs> the Mexican influence. Exactly. Thanks so much. We'll talk soon. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Well, there we have it. What do you guys think? Benedict Hardy of Hardy Cognac, five generations. This is some delicious cognac. She doesn't use caramel coloring. There's some other things that. People use in the production of cognac. It's interesting, you know, we're about purity and bourbon, but I think that level of attention and that passion for French spirits is not really thriving in the States. This is something I'm really kind of personally taking as an initiative to push these spirits, Calvados, Cognac, Armagnac, the Magic Three. So if you do get a chance specifically to try this hearty legend 1863 cognac, is quite delicious very deep and rich and wonderful in a sidecar she's and this isn't marketing speak it really just tastes pretty damn good in a sidecar so thanks everybody for listening to show to v no matter what you're doing this weekend because it's going to be cold and rainy or if you're thinking i don't know if i can rewrite a fleetwood mac song please keep dancing